The book of Revelation and its message falls within three divisions, and Jesus defines these in verse 19 where he says, Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. Now chapter 1 of Revelation focuses on what Jesus is showing John at the moment of this beginning revelation. Now as part of that present witness of John, our first message focused on the introduction of the revelation that John provided in verses 1 through 8. And this included the announcement, the blessing, and the salutation. Now our focus is on the last half of those things presently seen by John and, of course, this now concerns the foundation of the Revelation in verses 9 through 20. Now, here John reveals what he heard, saw, and witnessed. So our second message now deals with the foundation of the Revelation in chapter 1, verses 9 through 20. Let's consider what John heard. In verse 9, it says, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now here John identifies himself with his readers as a fellow believer because he mentions that he is their brother. But the identification actually goes further than just that because he also mentions that with them he is a companion in tribulation. Now that indicates the persecution taking place at the end of the first century and there was tribulation associated with it. These seven churches were facing various pressures around them, as well as troubles that were happening within. And of course, such is always the problem. The world attempts to stop believers through outside influences, while at the same time, pressures of compromise that come from within also threaten the church's purpose. So regardless from which it comes, it all mounts up to trials and hardships and therefore tribulations. And I think we do need to get a feel for what these people were facing in the latter part of the first century. At the time of John's writing, the Jewish community was especially facing a great deal of emotional concerns about a changing world order. Rome's domination of Judea, as well as surrounding nations, was increasing, and the Jewish nation was being forced <clears throat> into a place with very little influence. And the eventual fall of Jerusalem in A.D. 70 ended the existence of the Jewish state, that is, as a nation with land, possessions, and political power. They were literally a people without a country. Then the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem brought a demoralizing blow emotionally on top of everything else. And the Jewish nation found themselves running for their existence, being placed in involuntary exile and some into slavery, uh, and many of the same afflictions facing the Christians of these days were equally realized by the Jews as well. They were living in a time when they wondered about the world that they were living in, about uh, an upcoming and thriving world system that was dedicated to evil, that would force itself and its beliefs on everyone. But along with the political and social tribulation, these folks also faced spiritual persecution. Rome's increased control of all things political also made the government suspicious of how religious belief could influence political movements. So therefore, these Christians who would not worship the emperor were viewed as political subver uh, subversives rather than those merely wishing to exercise religious freedom. And this religious reaction to a political position was, in the view of the Romans, a sin against the state. Now, Jesus had said, Render therefore unto Caesar the things that, which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. And since believers would not give worship to Rome because that belonged only to God, Rome saw that not as a religious statement, but a political one, one that had to be silenced. And as a result, persecutions came, and all of that mounted up to tribulation. But John indicates in verse 9, that there is more to this companionship between them than just the tribulation they face. There is a fellowship, he says, in the kingdom. Now this speaks of all those who are part of and under the kingdom rule of Jesus Christ. You know, you can't be part of his kingdom if he's not your king. And you're not part of, uh, you're really not his subject if you're not subject to his control. Now these to whom John writes 
are part of the kingdom of Christ's rule. And tied inescapably to these conditions of companionship in troubles and surrendered control to the Lord is the companionship that is felt in the patience of Jesus Christ. Now, the word patience indicates that there is a hope to be realized through endurance. And I think we all know that waiting is not easy. But patience is that of putting up with something that, at least for the moment, would not be desired for the better outcome of what will be realized at the end of that time. And of course, that is precisely what the believers needed during this particular time. Well, John then goes on to tell where he was and the reason for it. He is in the isle that is called Patmos. Now, Patmos is located in the Aegean Sea in the eastern part of the Mediterranean. It's just off the coast of Asia Minor and Turkey. Its shape is kind of like an hourglass and seven and a half miles north to south, six miles uh, wide east to west, at, its, at least at its widest point, and it comprises about 13 square miles. Now, the wording of verse 9 could suggest two reasons that John was there. It could be that he was there to spread the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, such, such interpretation is allowable from the construction of the verse. But the most recognized reason is probably his banishment under the persecution of Domitian. Now, the reason for his being there would be because of his preaching of God's word and his testimony concerning Jesus Christ. In verse 10, he says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. There are various ideas expressed by writers relating to John's statement about being in the spirit on the Lord's day. Now, some will state that it could refer to the first day of the week, so it would be believed that John was having his own private worship service, as it were, and he was really having a truly spiritual time in the Lord as he went about his worship. Now, to substantiate that as a possibility is the construction that places uh, Lord as an adjective to the word day. And although that is a possibility, it really seems outside normal usage that's found anywhere else in Scripture to make this the first day of the week. Now, when the Bible at other places mentions Sunday, it's the expression first day of the week. And so it kind of sets it as the time of Christ's resurrection. It was never referred to as the Lord's Day in Scripture or during these early days. So for me, to make it so here would seem to be a stretch. Now, the expression that this regularly identifies with is the coming day of the Lord, which is the day of God's wrathful judgment on a sinful world. Now, this expression is commonly used in the Old Testament, and this, of course, is the subject matter being dealt with in the book of Revelation. And second, this is a vision concerning the future period to which John is transported ahead to see. So the expression shows how he was allowed to see the events that relate to this day of the Lord, the day of God's judgment. Therefore, being in the Spirit would be likened to the unique trance that prophets would at times realize when receiving special personal revelation from God himself. You know, something similar to this, just as an example, would be Isaiah chapter 6, when he was taken to the heavenly Jerusalem, to the portal of the temple, to see the Lord high and lifted up. Paul speaks of a similar experience in 2 Corinthians 12, of being caught up to the third heaven, and it was so real he couldn't tell if it were really in the body or was it in the spirit. So it seems most reasonable here in light of what we see to come to pass in the pages of Revelation that John is in the Spirit in such a way that God discloses special revelatory information specifically about the coming day of the Lord. This is the day of doom that God foretold through the prophets of the Old Testament and that he's now going to reveal completely in the New Testament book of Revelation. And with this happening, God carries John immediately to that coming day, and having done so, John hears behind him a great voice, as it were, he says, as a trumpet. Now, the voice he hears catches attention, likely booming uh, sufficiently that John recognizes the greatness of its source. And just the, at the sound of it, it evokes attention. But he also expressed it as though it were a trumpet blast. At one moment, it sounds impressive, beautiful, but also alarming. It's alerting. 
And during this day, trumpets were often used to announce religious feasts or special notices for the people's attention as to what was going to follow. So therefore, there's really no doubt but that God summons John to a revelation of himself. And that announcement is in the familiar, worshipful, impressive, alerting sound and fanfare of what is about to come. Without a doubt, God has caught John's attention to what is about to follow. We see now in verse 11, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. Here is the repetition of the one speaking and giving the message to follow. It comes with all the authority of eternity and he who encompasses it all. And he commands for John to write all of this down and then to send it to the seven churches of Asia. Now this obviously took place in that we have it here in front of us. The word seest is not only what John sees with his eyes, but that which encompasses the entire vision now provided. He'll not only see, but he'll also hear in this vision. And of the many places where we sense the interaction of God with man in the writing of the scriptures, we see God's direct command explicitly for this information to be recorded and preserved in a readable form. It not only comprises information that is to be stored in a book, but it's to be sent to the churches. Now the churches are listed and identified here, and we will see them individually in the next two chapters. So we'll save most of our comments about them for that time. But let's take a moment to look at the placement of the churches. They were literal churches in, the, uh, in existence in that day, and they each had real needs that Jesus speaks to them about. Now some take chapters 2 and 3, which are Christ's message to these churches as representing specific periods in history taking a historicist view of these two upcoming chapters. Now, I personally don't hold to that view. Uh, now, certain parallels might be interesting, however, uh, but I feel that the best approach is this. First, let the messages to the churches unfold as given, and then two, as it is with all scripture, recognize its relevance to the specific application that's intended initially. And then we'll also understand that the principles that are there are applicable to people of all time. Now this approach of interpretation additionally fits the first division of the book, where John is told to write the things that are. That means that these were literal churches in existence in that day that had real needs that Jesus speaks to them about. They also represent the churches of all times concerning needs that churches have always had and will still have until Christ's return. The importance here, I think, is not to try and find where we fit in within a historical setting for the message to that particular period. It's the need to hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches, and that will include every church then and now. Therefore, the information in Revelation is for reading, understanding, repetition, and application. It's the inspired word of God to the seven churches of Asia, but it's also for the universal church over all time. It's evident to us now that the churches of that era are gone. The people are dead. The message is no longer observable by them alone. The intent all along was for it to pass from them to succeeding generations of believers so the word might be accurately and consistently presented to church after church and year after year. Now we're going to take a look at what John saw in verses 12 through 16. Verse 12 says, And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. Now it seems odd that John would say that he turned to see the voice. Now obviously he recognizes that a person spoke, but all he knows before he sees with his eyes is that the voice represents a real person talking. It's the same as saying that he's turning to see the one whose voice he heard. Now he knows the voice spoke directly to him because he uses the words with me. So once he is turned, he's impressed with what first catches his eyes. He sees seven golden candlesticks. Now the word used for candlestick here 
is more properly that of a lampstand. These were oil-filled wick lamps that were on a stand. In most homes of the ordinary people, they had a single lamp with no stand, and it would be placed perhaps on a high table, a wall niche, or perhaps hung from the ceiling in some way. Now, some lamps would have a single stem that uh, would hold a single lamp, but among the more wealthy, some stems had a larger pedestal where several lamps extended from it. Now, in verse 12 here, it seems to be seven individual golden-stemmed lampstands with one lamp per stand. And if it were only one stand with seven branches, such would seem to have been indicated. Now, the number of lampstands John sees is seven. This number is, of course, a number usually associated with completion. Of course, Christ, in verse 20, provides the meaning of this particular uh, imagery when he says, The seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. So these lamps, the churches, serve to carry out their principal function. They're to shine the light ignited for them, which is supplied through the oil placed in them. And the golden metal speaks of the purity and glory of the one who formed them and whom they now represent. And now in verse 13, we come to the one of the most beautiful pictures. It's a picture of the risen and glorified Christ. It's in these next succeeding verses that John shares the picture characteristics of the one in the midst of the lampstands. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. This one to be identified is shown to be in the midst of the seven churches. The picture is that the lampstands are, as it were, in a circle with this one in the midst of them. And this one who is light is in the midst of those who were to mirror the light sourced in him. And as it should be, the churches should always have Jesus in the midst and center of all that they are and all that they do. And with that, John begins his ninefold description of this person. First of all, we can see here that he's the Messiah because he's like unto the Son of Man. This title used of Christ emphasizes his place within humanity as well as his character as Messiah. This is also used of him in chapter 14 and verse 14. And of course, this is the favorite title Jesus had for himself in his earthly ministry. And although the picture that we're about to get is far different from how he has been seen before, this person is he who is the one who walked among his disciples and among the peoples of the world as their Savior. Consider that up to this point, Jesus has mostly been veiled as it concerns his glorious existence as the sovereign God of the universe. Every picture that we have had of him previously has been accurate, but here in the book of Revelation, we have a full unveiling of the Savior. The curtain that has covered the Almighty One is about to be pulled back for a thorough observation. And the descriptions that we will see here are symbolic representations of Christ's attributes as He's now ready to step from eternity to earth in His full glory and power. John's description continues revealing that He is our High Priest because He's clothed with a garment down to the foot, girt with the paps with a golden girdle. It's not necessarily a garment that flows, but one that is full and complete. It reaches the foot so that uh, he's covered, but at the same time in no way hindered in where he needs to go and minister and what he needs to do. The girt is a binding or belting that goes around everything, and the paps are at the breast, and the girdle is the tie or the belt that joins it and keeps it in place. The garment presented here is really that of the high priest, Usually the golden girdle of the high priest's garment had a golden thread running through it, and here the entire sash is gold, which speaks both of completeness as well as glory. The height of its binding speaks of the freedom of movement that the high priest needed in his work. And here we see the imposing form of the Almighty draped with the robes fitting his office as priest. Many years previous to this moment, this one who was stripped of his earthly garments, and he who was laid bare for mockery and destruction. And with that shame, he hung on the cross, judged by an angry mob, the government, those who derided him, and eventually 
He was judged by his heavenly Father for our sins. At that moment, the Father stepped down from heaven and covered the shame of his innocent lamb with the curtain of pitch black darkness. But now, the scene in verse 13 is much different than that. Stepping clear into view is this Jesus who adorns himself in the mantle of the priest and who himself needs no sacrifice for he himself, but he comes as the eternal intercessor for those that he represents. No longer does he stand judged, but the one who has the right to justify the guilty through the sacrifice of his own blood and through his own mediation. In verse 14, it says, His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. Here he is, the Ancient of Days. His head and his hairs were white like wool. This description corresponds to Daniel's account of him in Daniel chapter 7, beginning at verse 9. I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. And in Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. In Daniel's vision, the Son of Man is coming to receive from the Father all dominion. And in John's vision, the Son of Man is doing exactly the same thing. And we, as we will see of him later, receiving the official coronation as the one through whom all judgment is going to come. Now, some have interpreted this description to be the white hair of purity. Now, his purity is true, of course, but I believe the connection between what Daniel's report of him is as compared to John's statement, gives significance to Christ's characterization as being the Ancient of Days. He also describes him as the Righteous One because his eyes were as a flame of fire. His eyes are able to see everywhere and to burn through all that is right and wrong. Based on that ability, he could judge correctly, and he can judge honestly, and he can judge righteously. He sees through the refining fire of purity, and with his look, he can purify that which comes before him. It's just like when Peter was, you remember, warming himself by the fire of Christ's enemies. At the time that the cock called out the third time, Jesus turned and he looked on Peter, and with that one glance, piercing conviction fell on Peter. Since Jesus is the eternally righteous one, he alone is the one who can judge righteously. And it says in verse 15, And his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. Here John reveals that he is the just judge, because his feet are like unto fine brass, as if they had been burned in a furnace. Brass, in order to be as pure as possible, has to be subjected to the fire, a fire that's so hot that it burns away all the dross. And that which comes through the fire is pure and it's refined. The significance for Christ is twofold. First, he himself went through the fires of trials and temptations and testing and the ultimate suffering of death and hell. And he came through the judgment of the cross successfully when he said, it is finished. It was not for the burning away of his dross and his impurities, but for ours that he took this on to himself. But second, based on what he has done, he stands thoroughly tested and upon refined feet to be able to judge all of the earth. Having the testimony of his own purity, he is the only one who can rightly judge anyone and everything else. That will be part of his ministry and responsibility later in the book. Here we see the one who is not only ready because of his background, he is ready and is on solid standing to do what is expected of him in the immediate future. But John also identifies that he is the all-powerful one. His voice is as the sound of many waters. Imagine that you're standing near the bottom of the cascading waters of Niagara Falls. 
You almost hear the reverberating roar of the nearly 12 million cubic feet of water falling every minute right at your feet. Can you imagine how loud you'd have to speak even to be heard from the overwhelming sound produced around you? And as John listens to this voice of the one who speaks with the force of depth and force, he recognizes the power that must be wielded by the one who would speak this way. The power of Christ is as great and powerful as is his voice booming with the sound of many waters. It flows with greater and greater strength. It speaks with an unstoppable force. And Jesus is the word of God, the living word. And when he speaks, all of the heaven stops and listens because it has all of the force of eternity behind it. It booms forth and accomplishes all that it speaks. It's with the simple words that he spoke that he created all of the universe. It's again a reminder to John and to us that nothing is too hard for God for all he need do is speak. His power is in his word and in the expression of his will. But now in verse 16 he says, And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. Now here John shows us that he is the caring sovereign, because it says and he, about him having in his right hand seven stars. Now the seven stars, as defined already in the context, are the seven angels or messengers of the seven lampstands or churches. The connection to the meaning of the seven stars is given in verse 20. Now we'll say more about it then, but verse 20 identifies the seven stars as the messengers of the churches. So the importance here has to do with how important it is that these seven stars are in the right hand of the Lord. The right hand that holds the stars has to do with power, protective care, and with direction. Christ has the church leaders and messengers under his care and protection, under his direction and leadership, and under his power and authority. And for the pastors, for these messengers, this is not about unwanted control or demeaning lordship. It's the picture of a caring Lord who's not going to allow harm or defeat or misdirection to come to them. But he also, in this passage, John is identifying that he is the warring conqueror because out of his mouth is going to go this sharp two-edged sword. Now, I identify him as such because, first, he has this sharp two-edged sword. Now, the word used for this sword appears five other times in the book of Revelation, and it refers to a weapon that's long and heavy. In contrast to that, for instance, there's a different word used for sword in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. And in that passage, the word of God is characterized as a two-edged sword that's quick and powerful. Rather than uncovering unbelief, the sword of Revelation 1.16 speaks of devastating judgment. Its sharpness means that it can cut swiftly, and its two-sided sharpness only adds to its thoroughness. And by the way, its efficiency and its effectiveness. And second, in Revelation 19 uh, and verse 15, where this sword is again mentioned, it speaks of it coming out of his mouth to smite the nations. And so the idea is that of a stabbing motion that thrusts forward. As you compare it with what you see here in our verse 16, it suggests the same motion. Not so much to slash back and forth merely to cause injury, but a forward motion in thrusting it through the enemy for defeat. And then third, there's significance in the historical use of this sword. The Romans' use of this long and heavy sword, sharpened on both sides and pointed at the end, was made to easily cut through. Uh, they were not interested in wounding on the battlefield. The purpose of the sword was to defeat the enemy, and they defeated the enemy by killing the enemy. Christ is also so supplied for his mission with that which is needed to complete it. But John also characterizes Christ here in what he sees as the glorified one because his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And although no picture is ever given of Christ's face other than its marring at the time of the crucifixion, the picture left for us is how it shines with an unmatched glory. We remember the story of Moses and what happened to him when he had been with the Lord for 40 days and nights and his face shone with the glory of God. You'll remember that at the transfiguration, Peter, James, and John all saw the glory of God's divine presence 
as it began to shine out through the flesh of the Lord Jesus. Here, John once again gets a sight as he's never seen before. He sees Christ in his glory. His brightness is as brilliant as the unclouded midday sun. It starts at a point of greatest brightness and so much so as not to even be able to stare at it. Yet its brightness radiates outward to everything before it. It's this same glorious light that blinded Paul on the Damascus road. I believe that it's a reminder that without the covering God would give us, no man can look on God and live. His ultimate being in righteousness and holiness is far too great for any to be able to stand, and without his preparation for it, we couldn't. Now, these are the things that John saw, but now things change to consider what John witnesses in verses 17 through 20. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. There's now a shift from what John sees to how he feels in response to it. The descriptions are not yet done, but John certainly feels undone in comparison to this amazing sight. I think we all remember Isaiah's response when he saw the Lord high and lifted up. Isaiah readily turned his concern inwardly when he said, Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Recall Paul's response when the Lord showed himself to him on the Damascus road. And suddenly, you know, there was a light that just shone around, around about him, a light from heaven. Of course, he fell to the earth blinded. Abraham fell on his face in Genesis chapter 17. Manoah and his wife fell on their faces to the ground in the book of Judges. Ezekiel fell on his face and Daniel fell on his face as well. John's response is a little different, but dropping to his feet in seeming death reveals just how moving a scene this is as well as potentially devastating to life. To drop in such a fashion is to describe that there was just no strength left in him for self-support. To get to this position is one of worship, most certainly. But you'll see that part of the emotion running through John is fear. And for that reason, Jesus lays his right hand on him to give him reassurance. It's also a laying on of the Lord's hand for strength to accept what's seen as well as to feel welcome and accepted in this new realm of glory. But how wonderful a picture it is when the Lord reaches down and places that reassuring hand on John. While God's sword is a threat to the wicked in death, his hand is a comforting reassurance of acceptance to the believer for life. What an almost unbelievable statement in that moment. Fear not. For the one accepted by Christ, there is to be no fear. Reverence is needed, absolutely, but no fear. That's not the purpose for which he has saved us. Just as we saw previously, Christ once again here identifies himself as the first and the last. He goes further to define himself in verse 18. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Christ is the one who is presently living, but he's also the one who became dead. As he's the ever-living one, he's the one who is living to ages of ages. But yet intervening for a moment was that time in the past when he died, when he became dead. It's not his present state now, but it is an undeniable reality of the past. It has no bearing on his future, for he is the ever-living one forevermore. Therefore, on that basis, he has the keys of hell and of death. Not that the devil was ever the one who controlled any of that, but Christ's victory over death confirmed that he is the one who controls it, not only for himself, but for those he died for for and for whom he rose again. He's the one who decides who goes there and how they're affected by it. The keys speak of his control of all that lies behind the doors of it, and it speaks of his responsibility for what enters it and under what conditions they do so. It also speaks of his ability eventually to lock the doors of it. 
You know, death refers not only to the dying in the sense that we first take it, but an obvious extension to the death that is eternal, the second death. And because of the place over which he has control, the eternal aspect is certainly meant. Christ controls the timing of death as well as the state of death where people find themselves. The word used here for hell is properly Hades, which is the state of being or place that houses departed souls. So the emphasis here seems to be the intermediate state rather than the eternal state of the lake of fire or Gehenna. These souls are not in limbo somewhere or in purgatory. It's the state of complete hellish torture that we normally associate with it that will be matched eventually and eternally in the lake of fire where both body and soul are going to be reunited. In verse 19, he says, Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. Now, we've already talked about this in our introductory information, so we're not going to spend a great deal of time on it here now. But this is what we believe is the key verse to the book of Revelation and to its division. And from this, we're also going to take the, our method of interpretation. Now, John has already provided us a complete picture of what he states first in this verse because he has written what he has seen. That is, he's written concerning the image of Christ. Now, John in Revelation chapters 2 and 3 is about to reveal the things that are, and those things that uh, are are those messages to the churches that are present at the time of John's writing. Now, we're not going to take the historicist view of the messages to those churches. We've already talked a little bit about that. However, the messages to them are the messages that are needed by the churches of all time periods. And that's going to be true, of course, until the church age is complete. Now, when that time comes to an end, the church will, of course, be raptured away. And then the things which shall be hereafter are going to take place. The vision of those things, which are yet to be future, are going to be revealed in the third part of the book. Now, Walford says this, The decision to follow this outline is a major one and can only be supported by the self-consistency of the interpretation of the book as a whole to which it gives rise. Now, if you consider what's being said in this verse and in the following verse 20, you get the, God's directive interpretation of how this book is supposed to be taken and what some of the things are supposed to mean. God's direction is what John is to do. He's to write. And he shows what divisions the writing is to fall under. He's to reveal the things that are related to the past, present, and the future. Then he's to lay out the basics of what the revelation already means, and this appears in verse 20. Folks, you cannot improve on divine interpretation, and he's given it to us here in this verse. Verse 20 says, the mystery of the seven churches which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. The mystery now is no longer. God has given the signification of what some of this means and how some of it's to be taken. And with these things being put into perspective, the message to the churches are now ready to begin. Now, interestingly, in verse 19, God's given the key to the division of the book. And in verse 20, God has given the key to understanding what has been revealed so far. Now, keep in mind that God will continue to do the same as we work ourselves through this book. Sometimes uh, he'll be more forthright with the interpretations of the symbols. At other times, depend on us to compare the symbols with other biblical symbols for that interpretation. But do let me mention that the angels represent the messengers of the churches, since the word for angel in Greek is, it has both the idea of angel or a messenger. We believe that this refers to the leaders of the churches and most likely the pastor who is charged with carrying that message to them from him. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in our next message. So what do we learn from this second half of Revelation 1. We have the opportunity to see Christ in all of his glory and divine preeminence. And when we speak of a book entitled the book of Revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ, we can see just how true this theme is right from the very beginning chapter. The remainder of the book will continue to reveal this Christ fulfilling all the characteristics that we see of him here. 
Among those pictures of the eternal God, we recognize him as the loving, sacrificial Savior. Along with that, he's the one in the midst of the churches providing and guiding his light. And being sovereign over them, he has right to continue to fuel or extinguish the light of each. And just as will be true for the churches in chapters 2 and 3, so do we need to recognize and surrender to the Almighty God who holds the keys of death and hell. Let me ask you, have you surrendered to Him? Do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Now, even though this picture that we see here casts a fearful tone to those who are unsaved, there is the greatest of encouragement for those who know the Lord. If you need to be saved, will you come to Him today? Will you call on Him for the forgiveness of your sins and give your life over completely to Him? 